Piaget, Jean Piaget, the developmental psychologist, who's a very smart guy, he pointed out something very interesting. He said, imagine you ran a set of iterated games as a competition. And in one iterated game, the rule was, you bloody well do what I tell you to. And the other one is, well, we'll all get together and decide how we're going to do this. Okay, now we run the competition. Now, Piaget's claim is, you do what I tell you fails. And the reason for that is, I have to impose force in order to keep you cooperating. And the imposition of force is a cost, it's an efficiency cost. And across time, that efficiency cost is going to multiply, and the equilibrated state solution, which is the one where we all agree, it wins. Now that's worth thinking about. You think, think about that locally. So you've got, you're trying to organize your family. You have a little family conference about who's doing what in the household. And what do you, if you want peace and harmony and an iterated game, you get everybody to say, well, here's the tasks. And we, they have to be done. People have to agree on that. And then you say, well, which task would you do? You have to do some. How about you? And, you know, which task would you do? And everybody agrees. And then you say, well, unless you can come up with a better solution, that's the one we're going to go with. And then people can be a little resentful and angry about the conditions of existence where they have to work. But they can't really blame that on anyone else. And maybe that's the best solution you can come up with. And that was Piaget's idea of the equilibrated state. It was like... It's a voluntary agreement that can be iterated across time that works at multiple levels of social organization. Man, that's a serious, serious, serious set of constraints. And Piaget, by the way, was looking for a way to reconcile science and religion. He was looking for a biological origin to morality. And he thought he found it in the idea of the equilibrated state. And it's even deeper than that. So imagine this equilibrated state idea is actually, there's something to it that if you set the, the state up properly, it will iterate across time so long that it becomes a permanent part of the environment. A hierarchy is exactly, that's exactly what a hierarchy is. Hierarchies are 350 million years old. They're not the patriarchal invention of white European Christian males in the last 300 years. They're 350 million years old. They're stable they're stable solutions to this iterated game problem. And they've been around so long that we're actually adapted to them. And that's part of the reason we have archetypal representations of the social structure. So, and we also have archetypal representations of the relationship of the individual <clears throat> to the social structure. Your job as an individual in relationship to the social structure is to embody the social structure, but also to serve as, as its eyes and its mouth so that it can update itself when necessary. So you take on the mantle of your father, let's say, but he's dead. He's the past. He can't see. You can see. So you take the structure that's already there and you modify it where it's necessary. And that modification process is necessary or the state becomes too static and collapses. And that's why the state has to be subordinate to the individual. And that's what Western culture has discovered. And we can't just let it go. That's the idea of the logos. That's a big idea. And you'd want to live somewhere where you want to live somewhere where the individual is subordinate to the state. It's like, hey, go right ahead. There's lots of places like that, man. Emigrate. Go there. 90% of the world's countries are like that. If you want to live like that, man, go find out what it's like. You don't see immigration going there. That's for sure. Okay, so that's a big mistake that the postmodernists made. It's not trivial, that's a big mistake, but it's not the only one. I mean, is there evidence, real evidence, that, that transferring management from public control to private control increases efficiency? That's a little tricky, because when you begin to look, you find a lot of other things. For example, in, what you find is that in places where the society sort of functions kind of more or less honestly and well, you know, say Sweden, or Chile for that matter, uh, public institutions are pretty efficient. So there is no pressure in Chile to privatize the biggest exporter, because it's very efficient. Uh, where there's pressure to privatize, it's usually coming from private power, okay, uh, not on grounds of efficiency. And in fact, if you look at the effects, it's just very unclear what they are. So I'm going mean, to take, say, the Brazilian steel industry. I mean, it, all, it was nationalized always ran at a loss, okay, so it looks inefficient by some measure. On the other hand, part of the reason it was running at a loss was because it was purposely, by state policy,
producing steel cheaply for the benefit of private manufacturers. In, in, uh, so it was a public subsidy to private manufacturers, which made the steel industry look inefficient. right? But for the economy, it might not at all have been inefficient. Uh, and when you proceed, that's what you find. So like in England, which is you know, a modern country, they privatized what the water system recently. And by economists' measures, it's probably more efficient. On the other hand, people aren't getting water. Poor people don't get water. You know, yeah. In fact, that's efficient. Like if you if you had only one, if you were put in charge of the of the dist water distribution system and you're only go you're an automaton, all human feelings are gone. Your only interest is maximizing profit. Well, you know perfectly well what you'd do. Uh, you'd cut out water altogether uh, for people who you know can't pay for it or are sort of not densely, not in some <laughs> dense area which has a lot of money. Why should they have water at all? I mean, after all, they can go walk somewhere with a bucket on their back and get water. That's probably uh, better by the macroeconomic statistics. So it's more efficient. Uh, and in fact, case after case, when you look at privatization, you find an extremely mixed picture. What you usually find is transfer of costs to the public. Uh, so take, say, privatization of roads. Well, you know, privatization of roads would mean you'd pay tolls if you're rich enough, and you'd go on nice highways. And if you're not rich enough to pay the tolls, well, you know, find your way down a dirt rut somewhere. You know, the total, um, you know, the economy might look much better. Gross national product would go up. Macroeconomic statistics would look good. For most of the people would be terrible. It's forced on them, forced on them from the outside, and it might be a good thing or it might be a bad thing. But you have to look at the cases. So, for example, just recently, uh, Brazil privatized the Vale, you know, big, huge industrial mining conglomerate. Uh, they sold it off to private power. Well, you know, that's the, a large part of the future of Brazil is there. Brazil has plenty of resources. Uh, the, there was an analysis of Vale done by, there were two analyses of the, le, you know, the uh, value of it. One was done by Merrill Lynch. That's the one the government was using. Merrill Lynch also happens to be, you know, the agent for a lot of the private purposes and purchases and so on. Another was done by the uh, uh, engineering department at the um, Federal Rio, uh, University in Rio. Good, serious people. I know some of them. I was down there about a year ago talking. Very serious industrial engineers and those people. They gave an evaluation of Ali, which was far higher, uh, taking into account future needs. You know, what would iron and gold and so on be worth uh, 20 years from now to the people of Brazil and so on. Those considerations weren't taken into account by Merrill Lynch, of course, uh, but they're real. Uh, well, you know, it was sold off and now a private power will make the uh, profit. Uh, I can just tell you this much. Uh, if you look at the, take a look at today's rich countries and today's poor countries, first world and third world. Go back a couple hundred years you find they weren't very different. In fact, India was the commercial and manufacturing center of the world in the 18th century. Uh, as late as the late 19th century, the British were deeply concerned by the fact that British textiles couldn't compete with Chinese textiles because they were much better and better done and so on. Uh, uh, the, they s changed. You know, uh, Egypt started to undergo an industrial revolution about the same time the United States did with comparable prospects. You know, they had their own cotton, big agricultural area, and so on. Well, you take a look at what happened since the 18th century. Two regions have developed outside of Europe, uh, the United States and Japan. They are exactly the two regions which were able to fend off European control. Okay, uh, The US separated itself. Japan was able to fend off European control. Japan's had the highest growth rate in the world since the Meiji Restoration around 1860. The United States grew very fast. How did they do it? Same way Europe did, by radically interfering with market principles. So from the very beginning, the United States was super protectionist, had massive, you know, large-scale state subsidies and so on and so forth. Britain had done exactly the same. That's how it became the richest country in the world. Every other industrial developing country has done more or less the same thing. I mean, they use somewhat different measure methods, like Japan happened to be much more liberal in trading than the United States was. But on the other hand, it had, you know, more authoritarian internal systems, so they vary in one way or another. But 
invariably, I think there is no exception to this, uh, they did it by sharp interference with market principles. Now, what about the third world? Yeah, they had new, what's called neoliberalism is not liberalism and it's not new. Uh, they've had it rammed down their throats for hundreds of years and that turned them into the third world. Well, one aspect of that is the kind of privatization which uh, leaves power in the hands of usually foreign industry or their local counterparts. We've just seen it go on in Mexico. Mexico's had the biggest privatization in modern history in the last, you know, actually the biggest privatization in history probably is the internet and the whole telecommunication system. Here is a system developed uh, at public expense which is being given, you know, it's not even sold. It's not even, it's not privatization, sometimes they sell it for something. Here we just give it away, you know, to private power. So that's huge privatization. But in third world countries, I suppose the main case is Mexico. And in fact, yeah, it's true, the Mexican telephone company and so on, they're getting privatized. Uh, and you're getting a small couple hundred billionaires, you know, service isn't improving except for the rich, getting a small number of billionaires. Uh, wages and incomes have collapsed by, you know, can't say a measure, but maybe 50% during the liberalization period. Um, in 1995, right after the collapse, uh, GNP went down by about 8 or 9%, still not recovering. Yeah, that's privatization.